Good day, everybody. My name is Mark Bernardo, and I'm the general manager for the automation software business here at GE Intelligent Platforms. And I'm going to be the host and one of the presenters for today's webcast. Uh, we're obviously incredibly excited to have you join us here today, and I'd like to thank you for making the time to be with us. Today's webcast is going to highlight approaches and best practices to transform your business and accomplish real-time operational intelligence by leveraging your existing automation systems and data. I'm joined today by another passionate industry expert, Mr. Mark Piper, who leads our real-time operational intelligence initiative here at GE. As part of our automation software business, Mark and his team are, are really pioneering the use of advanced applications. Uh, not only on, you know, mobile devices, which is, you know, I think a lot of what you're going to see here, but also in, you know, traditional uh, visualization platforms, really incorporating the same technologies and themes and concepts that we use in our everyday life um, and moving them back down into the industrial environment. Following the presentation, we're going to go ahead and answer some questions, and I definitely want to encourage you to, to enter your questions throughout the presentation into a widget you hopefully see on your screen. It's a little Q&A widget there. Um, so please go ahead and do that. And we're also going to review the results from an on-screen uh, poll. So there's a couple of areas where we're going to do some polls. And you know, we'd like to encourage you to participate um, when you see those come up. And then uh, finally, at 3 o'clock Eastern time today, we're going to do a random drawing for the winner of a Nexus 10 uh, tablet, a great device. And that tablet serves as a special thank you for your time. And we're going to announce the winner by email, and then post that to our website. So with all that said, on behalf of Mark Piper, myself, and GE, I'd like to thank you once again, and let's move right into our discussion for today. First and foremost, when you take a look at the industrial world, fundamentally we're approaching another tipping point that's really being driven by a few different factors. So if we take a look at in the next five years and project out, you know, 40% of the skilled manufacturing workers are going to retire, and with that goes all of the knowledge that they had. 50 billion machines are set to be connected to the Internet. Now, if we just take a look back just three short years ago, for the first time ever, the number of devices right, exceeded the world population. And obviously, right, in, in five short years, that's going to that's expound uh, exponentially. And then the last one is, uh, you know, if you take a look at our CIOs, the number one priority for them is to drive better business insight. But, you know, I would, I would say that probably the biggest thing is the fact that we have a new generation of workers that expect to have answers at their fingertips, just like they can in their daily lives. If you take that and you put it into a wider context, and you look at the industrial Internet, I'm sure most of you have heard about this and have seen some of the, the forces that are, that are really, you know, affecting this change. They really break down into four elements. One is the Internet of Things that we just talked about, intelligent devices, you know, so with cheap storage and processing power that people can get, you know, pretty much anywhere and, and everywhere they want right now. Um, it creates an environment where you can start to, to push intelligence down at the point of control. Big data big theme, right? Um, but at the same time, it's, it's real. Uh, you know, if you think about all of the different data across all of these devices that have to be aggregated and made sense out of, you know, this theme is, is going to become much more prominent over the next few years. And then the whole concept of analytics, which is driving new insights, you know, off of all that data. And, and you know, if you take one big step back and you say, look, well, you know, what does it really mean to us, right? In the industrial world, it's all about, you know, empowering our users. Um, and what we like to think about is there's really two elements to that. The first element is all around, you know, the new experiences um, that really are, are kind of driving new ways to not only live our lives but to do our work. And that's, you know, experiences that are seamless, so I don't have to kind of, you know, flip between different apps or different environments. I, I should be able to, to go from one action to the next. Um, the experience of, of being context-driven, role-based, connected, and intelligent. But also, this is not a one-size-fits-all world anymore. And, you know, creating um, environments that cater to the actual users 
is going to be really important. So what the operator, you know, is looking for is to be unshackled from the control room so that they can, you know, be free to, to walk the plant floor without losing visibility into the critical information that they need. Whereas the maintenance person is going to want to have some type of, you know, tools where they can collaborate with experts, but also to have some type of predictive insight when equipment or devices are about to fail. And the manager really wants transparency, right, at, at, at his or her fingertips that cuts through all the noise in the organization and really kind of gives him or her an overall sense of the health of their organization. So at this time, we want to take a minute for our first poll. And as you look at our, our changing industry, you know, we, we want you to think about what's the biggest challenges that you face. And, you know, if you could go ahead and just uh, click on the radio button that best matches uh, the challenge itself. We know that it may, there, there may not be one that captures it exactly, but if you could just pick the closest one, that would be great. You know, retiring workers, uh, high turnover of workers, that isn't necessarily due to retirement, uh, tighter budgets, so I need to do more with less people, quality, environmental, you know, maybe it's recalls. So, again, if you could just spend a moment, highlight the one you think best matches your biggest challenge, and then we'll move on. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, if we move into the kind of the meat of the, of the overall discussion today, you know, there's a, a, a concept out there that's called real-time operational intelligence, and it really represents a new call to action. And that call to action is to, you know, take the environment of, you know, data everywhere. And this is more than just data stored everywhere. And you think about the control rooms. You think about your operations today. You know, you have these screens with just a, a bunch of data points that have to be discerned. And right now, right, it is the operators or the other workers that can help, uh, you know, pinpoint what's important for what's not important. Now, again, that doesn't go away. But the true transformation and the promise is if we can drive from a world of data everywhere to actionable knowledge anywhere, anytime, you know, we can collectively, right, truly drive a ton of efficiency in our, in our operations in a future state. Now, you know, obviously that, that sounds all nice and good, and, you know, maybe it even sounds a, a, a bit cliche, but, you know, based on what we're seeing with the trends and in the customers that we're talking to, uh, we recognize that, that it's absolutely possible. And if you were to, to just think about, you know, the original trends that we had spoke of and think about this call to action, we believe that together represents itself in, in four distinct right, themes. Again, going back to this concept of connected machines or connected equipment, connected data, so aggregating all this, you know, disparate data out there um, that in, in many cases are islanded. Um, you know, driving new insights through having intelligence in line. So this is more than just, you know, doing back-end analysis in a historical, you know, data repository. This is about being selective and applying analytics into the process specifically so you can drive better insights and make quicker decisions. And then obviously making sure that, that, that we're connecting up the people, not only into all those insights, but to each other. And it's, it's you know, running a thread through each of those and connecting the dots together that, that truly drives that promise of real-time operational intelligence. And, you know, we're not the only ones that see this. If you look at Gartner, published a couple of papers um, last year, and here's just some, you know, quotes that, that they pulled out. The one that I think resonates the most for me is in that center bubble, right? In situations where there are lots of business events to consider quickly, real-time operational intelligence systems are required to improve people's situational awareness. And, and it's that, those last two words that I think are most important when we think about future state operations and what we need to do to prepare ourselves to be, um, you know, ready to deliver that type of, of value to our business, to our customers, whatever it might be. You know, and how does that come to be, right? It's really about delivering information in a new way that is, that is actionable. And Mark Piper will be talking more about how that actually happens moving forward. And if you actually looked at an example 
Uh, let's just take a look at our, our typical HMI, you know, SCADA offerings uh, today. You know, I'm sure most of you, you people today, uh, you know, have an HMI SCADA somewhere, somehow in your operation. And, you know, the concept of doing nothing but just mobilizing the screens and the information you have today is of extreme value. We have customers who have seen upwards of 20%, you know, productivity gains just by doing that alone. But, but the real call, right, to action goes, goes beyond that, right? The true value is about, it is about doing something other than just showing the same information the same way. And here's a, a summary of the best practices or pillars that are really going to be used to, to drive that concept of real-time operational intelligence. The first, as we talked about before, is data aggregation and storage. The second one is, is about context and relationships or about organizing data in a way that's going to make sense right, to the, the people that need to consume it. The third one is about noise reduction and, and insight. So this is where you know, the whole concept of, of leveraging analytics or algorithms or logic or even workflow um, in line to, to eliminate a lot of the noise that people have to deal with in their daily lives and help pinpoint what truly matters to them. Right information to the right people. This is about making sure that, that, that we have a, a strategy to marry the, the information that matters to the people that need to consume that information. Right? If, if I were to consume, if you were to present to me information and my role was a quality person, and you know, all the data you were, you were giving me was about you know, high-level management roll-ups or about specific production data that didn't have to do with my job, it just adds noise to my day. So this kind of marries that previous step, but it's really about tying together and, and delivering the right information to the right people. Collaboration, this is where knowledge sharing really occurs. Go back to that previous trend we had talked about for, for a minute. You know, we have our, our most experienced workers leaving the workforce, and you know, how do you actually replace it? We need to, to drive a level of collaboration that is greater than, than anything we've ever been able to do before, especially given that, in many cases, those workers aren't necessarily going to be in the same plan. So, so doing that in a way and leveraging technology is going to be a, a, a big part of that. And then making sure that you have the same information regardless of where you are. Um, if I'm down in the plant floor or in the control room or on my mobile device, I should have it, 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 the information I need at my fingertips. And if we were to apply that to an actual uh, example, and, you know, very simply, let's just take, you know, one of those pillars around context and to say, you know, what if I could take all the disparate information that I had and, and structure it and organize it, very simple, for a particular role, and then allow the people that need to see that information a, a clean view whereby they could immediately understand the health of their particular operation, whatever job or role they have, they can immediately understand the health of that operation at a, at, a, at a moment's glance. So it's about making sure we can serve up the right KPIs, give them access to the trends, manage the right outcomes, all at their fingertips. So with that as an example, we're going to start the second poll. We've been discussing, you know, real-time operational intelligence for a little while, and we have some great results and, and benefits across many industries. So we want to hear from you. Do you think that the things we just uh, talked about could actually help you in your overall role? The question, obviously, can real-time operational intelligence and mobility help you meet your challenges? Yes, we're moving forward. Yes, and GE can help. Uh, I'm not sure. And again, if, if that is the question, um, you know, we, we obviously, you know, have the means to, to actually help you discern uh, whether there are some needs there that can be fulfilled. Um, not yet, but in, in the far future. Or no, we've already evaluated it, and this is just not interesting to us. So again, if you could just take a moment, select the radio button that most closely resembles uh, what you're looking for, and then uh, we'll move on to the the best practice section of the, the uh, presentation. Okay. And with that, I want to thank you for your time again. And uh, now I want to ask Mark Piper to bring us through the, the second half of the, of the presentation. Thank you, Mark. Um, so the first step in the uh, process, and, and Mark described the way uh, best practices uh, are covered along a continuous loop. 
And what I want to talk about is each one of those. I want to go into a little bit of detail around those best practices. The first one that Mark talked about was the data storage and aggregation. You know, this is really dealing with massive amounts of data. You, a lot of places today, everywhere I go, every customer I meet has data. They have dispersed data, mostly flat, and they try to access that data in some form or another. But when you really look at it, we really want to start to change the way that massive data is aggregated and how that aggregation starts to have. It's great that people have that data today. It's better to have it than not have it. But if you can start to look at your data and understand it, the outcomes and what matters and start to basically structure that data along different lines like machine or line or plant or even in a more industrial big data sense where you're basically using query analysis to look across those, those areas and those, those plants and understand the best practices. But you need to do that in a very high-speed, compression, cost-effective manner. And so having that first step of aggregation is key to this new paradigm that we're talking about. So making sense of that data is the next step in the process. We want to make sense of that data not just by looking at it from a data or a trend. We want to make it actionable. We want to make that information really look at you and say, hey, this is exactly where I have to go solve for. And when we start to look at that, the, first, the next step in the best practices is structuring that data. And you all run your operations in very specific ways. You always drive home those operations to exact process or steps that you take, whether you do it informal or not formal. What we do in this best practice is we tell you to basically set up your system the way you run your operations, the way you run your business, the way you want those processes to be solved for. And so the first step is structuring that in the navigation type way and using that navigation to drive your process home. So when you start to do that, you begin to build what we call context. And when you have context, you basically start to drive the right set of outcomes. Now, you don't have to look at all that data. You can bring up the right key performance indicators that get you to start to look at the information that needs to go to action. And so we, when we talk about context, we talk about connecting all those dots for you. We talk about having alarms and analytics, and then the steps to go to action come right on the heels of that information. So here's, a, here's an example, and you can, I think you can relate. Everyone out there probably can relate to this. You have, you have a lot of dispersed areas. You have different situations. You have different challenges that you face in all those different areas across your campus or your plant or, or your entire corporation. If you can structure it and provide that context, and I'm going to take you through some examples here, that are going to start to basically you'll see the different practices and how bringing them together really drives home this story of real-time operational intelligence. So, you know, the first thing that happens is, you know, you have the context, you have the information, you've already put it into a very logical way that you run your business. Now, the best thing is to look at that information in a logical format, do the analysis or have the system do the analysis for you before you decide to, to basically send someone to someone like a remote platform like this where it's very costly and very inefficient. You want to make sure you have the info the causes, and possibly the action that needs to be solved before you even get there. So the first thing that we basically look at is, um, you know, taking the KPI monitoring to the next level. Take those key performance uh, indicators and key performance um, um, values and focus on the things that really matter. Focus on what you want to look at and go to action to. So when you really think about it, you know, one of the key practices of, um, of getting to, uh, the, uh, um, to your operations and running your operations is be, being able to get that to that information anytime, anywhere. It doesn't matter whether you're sitting at your desk. It doesn't matter whether you're in some remote place um, in the field. And it doesn't matter whether you're switching between those two places. 
We want you to see the right information at the right time, anywhere, when you need it the most. So the first step, you know, we talk about when we talk about mobilizing that data anywhere, anytime, we mention to you the best practice of structured navigation. What comes along with that is the right information. So I'm going to talk through some practices and some capabilities around mobility that allow you to see things like alarm state and navigation, and we'll talk about noise reduction in a few minutes here. But, you know, key is based on letting the information find you. If I'm somewhere where I'm close to a piece of equipment, I want to know what's happening in that area that I'm, that I'm being served. So we have concepts of, of geo-intelligence and, and looking at KPIs from a state or a relationship perspective. And then lastly, really looking at collaboration. You know, basically being able to talk back to the operations guy or switching between functions in your organization and understanding the steps that it's going to take to get the job done in the most effective and efficient manner. So one of the things that we've um, basically put into this real-time operational approach is this whole concept of the information finding you. We want to take that data we talked about that we efficiently aggregated up through those context-aware environments and let it find you. We want to know where you are. We want to let the information, the problem, the action that needs to be followed to come along with you. And this is all part of this new real-time operation. Why? Because it's more about efficiency. It's about basically getting you to action the quickest and possible way, the fastest way possible. And so when you look at it, you know, when a problem occurs in a remote area, you know, lots of times people just send a request. It's, you know, something that needs to get done, it gets out there. You know, we want to get that request to you. But what if you need more information? What if you need to know the steps that it takes to really serve? What if you need to change something that's miles away while you're working down, down the line at a remote location? So one of the other best practices in going to action, and we call it lead to action, and um, is really to eliminate the need to really have to be at the system that you're currently serving or have to know every process or every step or every instruction that needs to occur. We basically bring that to you with the information. And so the first step, you know, first way we do that is we do it with giving some more insight to, to really where you have to be. Um, you all have things like SCADA systems or, or plant application or quality efficiency type systems. When you look at those type of systems, you still have some very valuable data down at that layer, and you still basically do a lot of your practices down there. And so we basically maintain that by letting you basically drill down to the info. No matter where you are, you can get to any system in your, in your plant or in your site location. All that is configurable, and it's tied to your role and, your, and, and your, basically your capabilities as an individual. So we basically not only take you from information that shows you, we drill you into the information that allows you to take action right there anytime. And what if you have to basically start to look at, you know, what needs to get done? When you start to look at, you know, basically the work process execution or the work instruction, we give you a way to flow through that instruction. It doesn't matter, again, where you are. But more importantly, we're capturing the knowledge for those aged workers that are going out, that are basically retiring, as Mark mentioned earlier, um, and we start to basically get you to a much higher quality process. This allows you to basically drive your operations in a very consistent way, in a very logical way, and in in the way you want your workers to really execute on that action. So, you know, we talk about, you know, executing actions. We talk about, you know, getting information to you. You know, more importantly, you know, not everybody is a subject matter expert. Not everybody has all the knowledge that you need to basically solve. So what you need is to push things like collaboration. You need to get to a place where collaboration is simple. Collaboration allows you to bring information back and forth. So I want to introduce you to the concept of kind of just using technology that's out there today, integrated 
with your information so that you can basically have a conversation, as you can see in this, in this uh, plant layout, you can have a conversation between maintenance and operations, or maybe it's someone who's in the field. You can even take that picture using those remote smart devices that people have today and capture that information as you have that conversation. So, you, again, you're not going out there to the field and coming back with information, then conversing. You're out in the field, you're conversing, and you're going to action and fixing the problem. That's what this type of system, that's what best practices are. This is how you drive a better operational efficiency all around. So, you know, as you start to really um, start to collaborate and you have your structure and your context, the next step in the best practices is to really look at, you know, all these things that you consider noise. Mark mentioned this earlier in the best practices, and we talk about, you know, one of the biggest noise, noises that are out there today. And, and this is a true fact. I have actually have talked to a bunch of customers over a few years now, and alarms that people are driven to in their processes basically come in the form of noise in most cases. Now, there's a lot of alarms that are good, but 75% is the, is the current thinking around how, how, how many alarms are actually noise. A good example of that is when you basically look at a sensor. A sensor failure doesn't necessarily say that a piece of equipment or production is down. And so a lot of people react to alarm situations just, ba just based on sense of failure. Um, or you're not looking at things in the right way. You're not looking at, you know, the fact that something is on and another piece is off and, and you're really driving a wrong efficiency. Alarms typically don't do that. So this new best practice is using leveraging analytic capabilities and, and basically driving home and reduce those noisy alarms, but really, more importantly, get to the critical few actions that you need to get to. So we, this is a simple example, and I'm using the air handle because the air handles are pretty simple type devices, but they have huge, huge implications on not only operations and comfort in places like hospitals, but also on how much money comes off the bottom line in the, in, the, in the way of energy cost. And so if you can apply what we call analytic reasoners, and these are just true analytics, basically connected to situations, data that you have formed up that we talked about earlier, and you can run simple rule sets and logical multivariable analysis type, type analytics, you can drive home much higher efficiencies, get predictability, and never see plant down. Um, and so, you know, so when you really look at, you know, driving home these um, analytics, these are pluggable units that basically allow you to get to the right information at the right time. So when we look at um, really driving home these best practices along all these paths, one of the things that, you know, always, co uh, always come to mind is that, you know, people really believe that they have to have everything up, up and available all the time. And sometimes that's a big manual process or it's a shock or, or a surprise that something has gone down. What we're trying to do here is make sure you're aware, make sure you're doing the right practices, and making sure that the, some of the new system capabilities like analytics is helping you be more proactive and keeping that, that availability as high as it can be. One last thing that I want to mention when you think about, you know, these best practices and, and the way to leverage um, some of the data that you have, you all have systems that are out there today. You all have brought your data up through those systems. We say that best practice is never, ever lose sight to those existing systems. We want to protect the total cost of ownership that you have basically invested into those systems. So to give you a little architectural example um, on how this all works is, you know, we're going to leverage the systems that are down below, you know, your SCADA systems, your historians, your lab type environments. All these type of systems have very valuable and very, um, very efficient type data that for, for served as a purpose. 
And so what we do is we take that data in an aggregate way, like we talked about, in a very efficient way. And by applying these basic practices, we basically structure it and then serve it up as information with tools that are built across the board, taking you from your browser in your office to taking a note or collaborating with a picture, all the way down to setting a control point or looking at a deeper analysis of one of those systems. This is how you hold total cost ownership and increase your efficiency. With that, I'd like to hand it back to Mr. Bernardo um, and let him just uh, um, summarize what we've uh, talked to today. Thanks, Mark. So, you know, hopefully what you did is uh, found yourself in, in some of the best practices that, uh, that Mark had just brought you through. You know, I'm sure many of you have already invested in capabilities or, or technologies to, or to realize some of these gains. You know, some of you maybe have not even, you know, started to think about this. And, and uh, you know, our sincere hope is we were able to, to spark, you know, a, a new way of, of, you know, thinking about how to drive future state operations um, in using some, you know, capabilities, technologies, and, and just philosophies in many cases, right? Um, again, you know, I, I think the, uh, you know, the, the real opportunity as we, as we step back is, is, you know, be really, really thoughtful about, um, you know, what information is going to be important and what roles you want to empower and what outcomes, you know, you're really looking at for your business. And then whatever that is, right, lay out uh, a strategy and a, and a series of investments that are going to, you know, enable, you know, those users to, to not only gather new insights but to be able to take those insights to action. So with, uh, with that all said, we'd like to move into our Q&A section. As a reminder, you can submit your questions using the Q&A widget on your screen. And while we're talking, a few minutes for you to enter those questions. Let's just uh, review the results of the poll. You know, if you remember, the question was, as you look at our changing industry, what is your biggest challenge? Uh, you could select from retiring workers, high turnover of workers that weren't from retirement, tighter budgets, quality, environmental recalls. Um, you know, if you look at the breakdown based on your results, uh, tighter budgets, uh, doing more with less, actually represented more than half, uh, 57%, followed by quality at 21%, retiring workers at 12 and then the remaining 10 um, was between higher turnover and environmental. Um, so if you t take a look at the, the first two for a minute, right, hopefully, um, you know, we were able to answer some of those in the, in the session. Um, yeah, hopefully we're able to answer some of those in the session. But the, fir the first two on tighter budgets, um, specifically, you know, if you think about, um, you know, context and the ability to focus on the critical few, we had talked about really looking at your, your uh, strategy, understanding the outcomes that matter uh, based on role, and then making sure you have, you know, a mechanism that can get the right information to the right role, um, you know. When I was talking to uh, to one of our customers, and we were we were talking through some of the challenges, you know, they had the the, the, the quote that still resonates with me today is the untrained eye looks everywhere, and you know, really what they were talking about is you know they had had some um, new very skilled workers that uh, that came on, but they had you know a limited ability to to discern important from unimportant, so they were really reacting to everything and, and, uh, and being less efficient in the process, right? So, so really being able to make sure that the, the, the people are armed, or especially if you have, you know, an individual that is filling multiple hats, that it's crystal clear for them, you know, um, what they should be focused on at, at the right time. Uh, the second one, which I'm going to ask, actually ask uh, Mark Piper to, to take on for us, is around the, the quality component. So, Mark, maybe you can you can kind of just provide some additional context on, on that as a poll result. Thank you, Mark. Um, and so, so when you look at the, uh, the quality component um, of, uh, of the, the best practices of RTOI, you, you tend to, uh, you know, really look at it from a perspective of uh, um, driving home, you know, the information that is coming to the user, to the operator really bring in the attention to what the right information that that operator needs. But more importantly, we want to make sure that, that we're going to action with the right set of processes, the right set of instructions, because we do have different people 
different skill levels out in the field. And so when you look at real-time operational intelligence, it's not just about you know, bringing just data and serving up data. It's about taking that data, aggregating it in the right way, and then forming that context and that, and that knowledge around it to get that person to the right set of actions. And when that action is, is um, very specific, you can basically use things like digitized work instructions to drive that process the exact way that it needs to get done. Um, so I'll hand that back. I'm going to hand it back over to Mark now. So if we move on to our questions, uh, just looking through the list, uh, I'll actually be taking the, the first one. Uh, it is, will today's presentation be made available? And the answer is absolutely will be. Um, you'll actually receive an email with a link to the archive of the presentation, and the archive itself will also be posted up on the on-demand event section of our, of our website. Um, the next question is, uh, do you see the solution replacing uh, SCADA? Absolutely a, a fantastic question, and, and the, the answer to that is, is no. I mean, when we talk about the capabilities and the best practices um, that we went over today, you know, it's really about dovetailing those into, um, you know, your, your SCADA capabilities and functionality as we mo move forward, right? They really should dovetail into one another and represent kind of a next generation solution. And, and you know, Mark also, you know, had talked about the idea of making sure that, um, you know, your, your current investments are protected. So, you know, the, the thought process when you're, you know, developing your strategies is, is to think about, you know, the, the capabilities and the investments that you need to make that can, that can leverage, um, you know, what you already have to bring new value out of that uh, to make sure that you manage your total cost of ownership effectively. Uh, the next question will actually uh, uh, give this one over to Mark Piper, and the question is, how do you address security um, in this environment? That's an excellent question, and uh, it always comes up uh, every time we talk about, you know, getting information anytime, anywhere, especially over mobile-type environments. And when you think about best practices, this is just one of those areas that are kind of underlying core that you have to basically um, have in place. Um, and the best way, you know, we have some documents and, and security white papers um, present on our website, so you can uh, use those to get into detail, but in general, um, security is all built on layers. And we built this system so that we can play in different layers. If you're in the red zone or the control zone of the layer, you want to always keep that very secure, very, very highly, you know, only certain people get to, to look in, and do things in that environment. The system is built so that you can basically configure it that way. You can also expose it, you know, to a higher level in the corporation, but still on the internet. Or you want to go 3G or 4G light, and you want to basically expose it onto the Internet. This system, you have to think through those firewall conditions, those zones as they're called, but you also have to know that the system is built in context of that. It has the encryption services built in from southbound all the way up to northbound. It has the clients. These are best practices and best capabilities that are out there today built into these systems. Um, so security is a, definitely a consideration. And you definitely should talk through it to make sure you have the right, um, your right set of uh, processes and plans in place around security. But this system is built for that, for exactly that purpose, to secure the data and get it to the right information, the right information to the right people. And another question in the list here is: Is GE going to roll out um, real-time monitoring operating capabilities via? via mobile devices, and, um, you know, in many respects, we already do that, but especially if you look at the investments that we're currently making, you know, I want to, I want to take us back to, you know, one of the core best practices, which is really anytime, anywhere, and, and the way we tend to think about it, and, and you know, we'd obviously, you know, um, ask you to kind of think about it the same way, is, you know, start with the experience first versus, you know, is, are we going to do something on a mobile device versus not a mobile device? You know, I think we need to just think about what, what the specific, you know, workers in our organization need. And then if you drill down, you know, depending on who those workers are, really thinking about the experience that you need to, to drive for them. And then making sure that experience is, is as similar as possible regardless if they're sitting at, you know, a desktop or down on the plant floor or in a web browser or on their tablet. Obviously, the form factor is going to be a bit different, um, 
and there might be particular elements that are going to lead to a richer experience, but the experience should be exactly the same, and it, sh and it should always be focused on, you know, first and foremost, how can we just make sure that the right information is finding the, the right person, right, whether they're, they're sitting down at their desk or, or in the field on a mobile device, and, and then enabling them to take action on that. And as long as that's consistent, regardless of, of where they are, then you really get the, the true values, um, you know, out of the overall equation. But the, the short answer to the, the question was, uh, yes, yes, we are. Okay, if we, um, there's a lot of great questions here, so just give me a, a quick second to, to get another one up here. All right, handing this over to Mark. Give me a second. So one question was asked about um, this system running in conjunction with uh, our plant applications products. Um, I want to just let you know that everything we talked about, the best practices and the, and the content does run with all of our prophecy products as, so, as sources and third party as well. So uh, there's a couple questions actually wrapped around all that. Um, the other question that came up was, um, you know, can we look at dispersed data? And, you know, dispersed data came up uh, in, in the form of uh, PLCs or control panels, databases, and the answer is yes. And I'm going I'm to caveat that just a little bit because, you know, these are all general terms, databases and control panels, so I want to be very careful. Um, we do bring data sources, both ones that are prophecy data sources, back into this environment. But we also bring dispersed data. We can bring, you know, flat files, uh, our historian, our driver-based products all have the ability to bring so, uh, data from, from a lot of different sources. So depending upon what sources you're really looking at for data, the whole key to this is aggregating it and compressing that data in the right, in the, with the right set of tools and the right set of uh, products, and then making that data very normalized with context and structure. And that's what we're trying to bring through this best practice is using those type of best practices will drive a higher efficiency in the operations. Okay, there's another question here. Um, actually, it's, it's around the recording of the presentation. Yeah, we had already answered that one. That one is uh, a resounding yes. A um, bunch of questions around security, which I think we've already uh, kind of get gotten to. Oh, here's a great question. Hold on. So someone asked the question about the alarm noise, uh, the 75% number, and 75% comes from you know just really operational practices. These are you know alarm type systems that bring alarms from multiple sources. And a lot of operations live in and die by their by the way they handle those alarms. Um, these are not 75 cent based on sensors failures. Uh, these are sense, these are alarms that come in that can, you know, be effectively um, dealt with either in the in the way of bringing more information to light or the actual cause to light um, using things like analytics and reasoners as we talked about in the presentation. But it also could be just you know an alarm that is driven you know, based on some pattern that has happened in the past. So a lot of alarms go, you know, you know, when a motor comes up in the initial stage of a stop of a motor, you get a lot of flutter of alarm traffic that comes in. And analytic can actually understand that and see it go to steady state. If it's not trending or patterning to that steady state, you know, the analytic or the alarm condition will be brought back to light. If it looks like it is, you don't have to worry about those alarms. They get normalized out and that condition is basically a safe condition. And so that's the way to think about, you know, some of the noise reduction that you can see as opposed to dealing or overreacting in most cases um, to a bunch of alarm conditions. You know, there's another question here that's asking for um, a particular concept to, to uh, provide some additional detail. And it's, it's around... Um, you know, the whole concept of, of, you know, making sure that we're pinpointing what to measure. Um, you know, so, for example, if you look at a lot of our, you know, operators and users today, um, you know, they may have thousands and thousands of data points, in, in many cases, plastered all, you know, um, around multiple screens. And, and because of their, their knowledge and their experience with the process, right, they can, 
they can understand what the correlations are. But if you actually sat them down and said, you know, on a daily basis, you know, what do you really look at? What's important? Um, you know, the, the very specific indicators or some very specific outcomes always come up. So if you, if you were to sit down as a business and kind of map those for the most critical operations that matter to you, and then set those up as, you know, very specific KPIs or data points. And again, going back to Mark's previous point, it could come from a SCADA system or part of it could come from a SCADA system and other components could come from another system. But if you could rationalize all that information down to, you know, these 20 things that I care about. When I log in, when I bring up my, my iPad in the morning or, or my Android device in the morning, um, I have these five things that I look at, and I know if any one of these right, uh, show an anomaly, I immediately have to act. That's really what we're talking to there. Right? It doesn't mean that all the data ha you know, goes away. You still need the data. But based on the, on the role that you have, you want to make sure you're thinking about the most important things to measure and trend based on role, based on individual, so that you have more of a catered, personalized ex in, uh, experience for, for those people. Another question that um, was uh, that I just uh, picked out of the list here um, it was about um, really about how you configure this thing, how do you make the information available to the right person. Um, it, you know, it's all around the way the system, the way the practices in the system is approached with context. So, like I explained during the presentation, you know, you're going to build a context around the way you run your operations, the way you run your business, and and how those how the, how you do how you get to action today is going to be mimicked so to speak in the system all the way down to the exact work instruction that you want to do these these concept, these best practices are going to drive not just quality levels up they're going to drive efficiency up because people are going to get to the right information uh, at the right time now it doesn't mean that you know you're basically showing a trend to a person or or measuring something this is all about the role this is about the role and what information you want him to be served, what actions you want him to be served. So we're really catering to the person or the people that are, that are getting served this new information, this new context. So I want to make sure that that was clear um, on this question as well. Uh, there's a question here, real simple one, but uh, we'll certainly start there, and it's around where do you start. And, you know, I think the, the most simplest thing to, to think about is, um, you know, if you go back to those best practices for a minute, um, you know, probably pick where you are in, in that equation. So, for example, you know, we have customers that, that honestly really don't have a data storage or a data, ag you know, aggregation strategy um, today beyond what they might already have, right, in their, their SCADA system. Or in other cases, you know, we have customers who already have the data, and they're just really trying to find a way to, to you know, get that data to the people that matter, um, you know, a lot quicker. When we think about, you know, some of the challenges that, that our customers have, you know, in, in the food and beverage industry, especially as it relates to food safety, what, what they'll obviously and sometimes say is, you know, we know when, when the defect, right, is found or where something starts to go bad. The problem is, is getting that information, right, connected up quickly enough. So for them, they already have the data. It's about how to map it and mobilize it. So unfortunately, there's no real, um, you know, one-size-fits-all answer to that question. But if you kind of find yourself in, in, you know, those best practices, and if you can say, look, I already have, you know, my, my, um, my data collected. I have a very strong, you know, aggregation strategy, but I just don't serve it up in context. And then where you should start is, you know, in, in looking at or investing in capability that allows you to, to map that data and then start to, to either mobilize that data um, from an iPad or, or um, an Android device or just, you know, use your existing, you know, web type uh, interfaces to serve it up. So another question that um, is uh, that came up here is about um, just talking about some customer examples where um, efficiency has been gained. So let me give you a few, um, obviously without names. I'm, uh, you know, so I'll give you a few scenarios. Um, we have this system running in, in, a, in a bunch of areas now, a bunch of verticals, and the ones, the verticals that tend to get a lot of advantages of the anytime, anywhere, geo intelligence type approach. Um, are the infrastructure type customers, the oil and gas, the uh, the wells, the um, 
the water and wastewater environments where there's a lot of remote sites, a lot of uh, um, places where you need to be. You need to understand what assets are there and what the current conditions of those assets are. We've had a lot of customers basically come back and tell us after they've used the system that they were able to get more information when they were basically on site, on premise, to drive the right set of solutions that they needed to get to. Um, not only that, they also see other things there while they're there. And so, um, so they basically get that information from the operations. They're able to collaborate with the operations people back at the, at the, at the corporate office, so to speak, um, and get more information back and forth. Another example is, you know, we have a bunch of um, reasoners running, um, analytics running against data um, that are looking at um, different types of pieces of equipment. And we've seen huge amounts of productivity gain in the sense of saving energy cost or understanding that something's on longer than it should be or um, it's running at a higher temperature than it should be and it's because of these other variables that are making that happen. So having that information, that causal analysis, lets the operator not have to go do the analysis himself. And this is all built into these reasoners and the efficiency gains that we've seen. Um, and then um, another question that was here, I just wanted to, um, someone asked about the OS. Um, all the, um, the um, server side of our stuff is run around the, uh, the Windows-based uh, server products that we have today. Um, and then all the client side is done in HTML5. And we have uh, specialized security and encryption layers that fit in between those layers, like I talked about earlier in the security thing. Um, so, um, so I'm going to ask. I'm going to answer, answer one more question. I'll pass it back to Mark for another question. But um, so, someone asked about from our experience and the customers that we've installed this uh, these systems and dealt with, you know, putting them through these best practices that we talked about. What was the level of effort that an organization is required to organize this data? And this is an excellent question because sometimes people, you know, tend to wrap themselves around, wow, how how hard is this to actually do? And frankly, when you really look at it, you know, it's not like you're going to take a 10,000 tag system that you have in there and expose everything. What you're going to do is you're going to basically drive yourself to what we call those key performance indicators, things that you run your operations every day. That's a more limited set. And so what we've gotten people basically all the way to mobilize data, within a couple of days you're actually seeing, you know, portions of your data across your plant. Within, week, within a couple of weeks, you pretty much have already tailored to your operations. And then you, it's all about just, you know, t fine-tuning it from there um, as you basically, you know, wrap it more closer to the way you want to run your business. As a matter of fact, you'll see ways that you want to run your business better as you're walking through this product process. So, so from, you know, we basically, from two days to, you know, a week, you are mobilized and you're basically seeing your data in this new context. You know, another question is, is um, a little bit more specific about, um, you know, our product line. The question is, you know, what in the Prophecy uh, product line helps users store and share expertise from skilled workers? Is it a best practice or is it actually enabled in the products that we offer itself? And the, the obvious answer to that is, is both, right? Um, you know, the, if you look at the products um, themselves, you know, Mark talked about the, you know, digitizing, um, you know, standard operating procedures and, and, you know, the knowledge first and foremost. And, and we have a, a workflow product that enables you to, to do that and then obviously drive those operating procedures right out to the people that matter so they can execute on them. Um, you know, in the, in the context that we talked through today, if you take that fact, right, uh, standard operating procedure, and you marry it with everything else that we talked about, you know, you start out with a high-level insight. You know you need to do something about it, and then you can lead that directly to action in context. So I'm on this particular asset. I'm looking at this particular pump. I know it has a problem. I want to execute a procedure to actually, you know, take this offline and, and do a maintenance event on it. And so, so that's one element of it. The other element of it is, you know, around the, the collaboration, you know, piece. Um, Getting the knowledge in the in the right hands is key. So you know the thought process is you know not just enabling a real time environment where people can can collaborate in context based on you know I'm looking at the exact same process or event, um, but also making sure that you can capture that so that you know when someone goes out in the field and does an action, they can actually enter in a note that gets stored and associated with that particular device or that particular 
uh, operation so the next time someone comes to it, they actually know, you know, what occurred. And if you take that, you know, even one step further, you know, the thought process would be you can start to map each of those, you know, solutions up, up against particular events. So you can start to correlate and, and do things like 90% of the time when this particular, you know, issue happened, um, the, the solution was X, right? And then 10% of the time it was something else. So you can start to calibrate not only how you capture the knowledge, but how you actually, you know, perform the operations with much more quality and reliability. Um, and that's, that's really the, the key there. So um, another question that came up was, uh, you know, more of a probably a little bit deeper explanation of how RTOI predicts failure. Um, you know, you know, there's several ways to look at, you know, failure um, and predicting failure. Um, and these al algorithms or these analytics, as you, uh, as people call them, um, we call them reasoners. They plug into the system, and they do very. They're basically built for very specific purposes. First and foremost, you know, you can have um, algorithms and, and uh, analytics that basically um, look at very specific patterns. And it doesn't really matter what the control point is or the tag or the data that's coming in. It's always looking at that data in the same way. And it's, and it's trying to capture change that's happening or deviations that are happening across that path. And these can come in the form of you know, uh, statistical uh, process uh, control algorithms. It can come in the form of uh, sensor pattern matching. Um, these are more horizontal, as we call them, horizontal reasoners uh, built for very specific purposes, but against generalized data. The other way that you can look at some of the failure is, is definitely looking at um, um, the analytics from a very specific piece of equipment or a vertical or a process that's being formed. And these are a little bit more complicated because it's looking at the kind of the whole machine, as you will, and trying to understand what is happening within the machine around multivariable analysis. Now, these are very, very useful. Um, you could use these to actually detect, you know, where an actual leakage point or something is being done inside that piece of equipment. So these are, you know, these reasoners are, are you know, well-known. GE has been doing it for a number of years now, several years now. Um, really using our subject matter experts in the equipment that we build, but we're kind of applying now those practices that we um, have done for years now to a home, to really a more horizontal piece of software that allows you to basically build these on your own or build them with the subject matter, matter experts or take the GE ones as they, uh, as they continue to come out. Um, another question that came up um, that I wanted to cover was uh, was asking about Android phones and smartphones. Um, you know, we have um, a bunch of platforms already out there, um, from Android to uh, to uh, iOS uh, to browser-based, either Chrome or IE um, or Firefox. So um, we run all those. The smaller form factors um, will be available in the uh, early Q1 timeframe, um, and they're you know they're basically already in development and test right now. So um, so, but the uh, the more tablets, the more that people use, see the, you know most of the data and be able to interact with the data, the tablet and the browser has been the more popular one for us. Okay, um, you know, there's another question here around how much of existing uh, data sources can be used directly and how much of it needs to be modified to be usable on the, on mobile devices. And, and again, we, we talk about this in, the, in respect of a best practice, right? The idea would be to, to make sure that, that whatever devices and methodology you're using to, to kind of enable right, this, this new you know, paradigm, it really wants to be normalized. You know, I know we talked about this a lot, but the, but the great thing that normalization does is it makes the, the front end experience seamless regardless of what's on the, the back end, right? All of that gets abstracted away. Um, you know, so if you, if you think about, you know, that in the context of this question, the, the, the data on the back end really doesn't need to be modified. It does need to be mapped, right? So as long as you can access the data and then bring it up into, you know, a, a tool that can help you, you know, model the data and then just map where we get the, the data from, you can push it out to an interface that creates a new normal, normalized and, and very, very seamless experience. Um, one additional uh, quick question. Someone just asked about the, the website itself, if someone wanted to, to understand 
um, you know, more about what we talked about today, and, and that can be found at www.ge-ip.com and forward slash RTOI. Um, and, and with that, um, you know, I think that's all we have for um, – or all we have time for, unfortunately, for the, the questions. Uh, we will address all the remaining unanswered questions by email. Uh, we would ask that before you go, there's a resource widget at the bottom of the screen that you can click on, and um, from there you should be able to download an ebook that has a lot more information behind what we spoke about today. Um, I'd like to remind you that we're going to be conducted our, our drawing uh, very, very shortly for the winner of the Nexus 10 tablet, and we'll announce that winner by email and also post that on our website. And um, with that, to everyone who spent time this afternoon to attend this uh, webcast, um, on behalf of myself and Mark Piper and everyone at GE, um, a sincere thanks, and, and uh, we encourage you to, to reach out if you have additional questions um, you know, to myself or Mark via Twitter or LinkedIn or um, you know, in the material that you'll download, there will also be some additional contact information there. Uh, we're certainly you know, committed to helping you improve your business, and, and you know, uh, likewise, when there's feedback that can help us improve ours, we're, we're all ears. So with that, thanks a lot, and have a great day.